Okay, I think we're going live now. Should be coming up in a minute. We come up on Facebook yet? Okay, I think we're live. Um, g'day everyone. I just wanted to, uh, it's Ryan here from No Meat May and uh, we're very lucky to have with us today um, superstar chef and all around great guy, Simon Bryant. Um, so Simon's uh, going to uh, teach us how to make um, the perfect falafel along with the hummus and tabbouleh. How are you going, Simon? Yeah, I'm good, Ryan. Thank you for the opportunity. No worries, mate. Appreciate you giving up your, uh, giving up your Saturday afternoon to help us out. Um, Not a hell of a lot else going on at the moment. <laughs> in lockdown, cooking in lockdown. Um, I just wanted to say as well that anyone who's at home, um, the idea today is to cook along with Simon. So you've hopefully got all your uh, lent, sorry, your um, chickpeas and broad beans soaking overnight. And you're uh, all ready to get in the kitchen, have a go. So um, uh, one lucky person who posts a picture of what you cook on the Facebook page will win um, some of the products from, from Simon, which is the uh, Dirty Brand chickpeas, broad beans, and uh, lentils. So you can cook it all again, over again. Um, and also this brilliant book from Simon called Veggies, which is uh, a really beautiful book, actually. So I, irrespective of whether you win it or not, I'd say go on his site and buy this book because it's a real beauty. Got um, heaps of recipes um, using veggies by, um, uh, by season. Um, and yeah, plenty of stuff to keep you going through No Meat May and beyond in here. So um, thanks again, Simon. So I'll get out of the way now. And um, if you have questions during the class, just pop your questions into, a, into the comments thread and we'll try and um, make sure Simon um, gets uh, get to Simon. He can answer your questions. So enjoy everybody. And uh, yeah, we'll um, get in the kitchen. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Um, yeah, um, I write a couple of veggie books before the cool kids all got veggie like in the kitchen but you guys were there already um so i go by season and i kind of just the books are not that fancy they're what i like to eat but i do like to eat falafel do like to eat hummus um i'm going to show you how to do a really nice falafel and also a little tabouli salad and a hummus but we're going to really focus on the falafel more than anything so you need it to soak up half a cup of raw beans and half a cup of chickpeas. Now, don't use canned ones there. Uh, sorry, they're rubbish. Um, if you have to, fine, but otherwise just go and get them, soak them up. I've got some information on my website about pot soaking if you forgot um, how you can get around that. Um, you can use half chickpea half broad bean or any combination of or all chickpea if you want. All broad beans are a bit tough. It's a bit hard to go. So these are some Kangaroo Island broad beans, aqua dolce, which is sweet water. Um, drain them off. They've just been soaking for a day. And these are York Peninsula, um, oh, volume. I've got a feedback loop of my own TV. York Peninsula chickpeas, half a cup. And then you need a food processor. So just chuck them in the processor and get everything else ready. So if you um, like fibre, I do, and texture, the broad bean version is very good. Um, there's a really good chapter in Odd Lindy's cookbook about the variants of falafel through the Middle East, Palestinian, Palestinian version versus the Israeli version versus the Egyptian version. Um, you're going to need some onions, so per um, half a cup of the pulses, one onion. Now, you need to chop it because the problem with onions is that in this dish is they have water, and water is kind of your enemy. This. You need to keep it as dry as possible, which is why it's soaked, uh, drained off the raw bean, bean and chickpea. Um, and if you put it in too early, unchopped, it'll go pretty mushy and it'll loosen up the mix and it won't bind. So try and chop it first. Um, the garlic, well, it doesn't really matter. I'd probably get there on its own in the food processor. A couple of cloves of garlic. Um, and 
then you needed to have toasted off. Well, you don't even need to toast it off. Just coriander and come in a teaspoon or half a teaspoon of each. The recipe's on the, on the website. Um, and a couple of green chilies. Now, if you like a hot leaf, the seeds in, have a taste. Well, they are hot. Okay. Yep. <laughs> seeds coming out. Um, it used to be pretty well, you know, you could, a uh, big green chili was a little bit sweet and mild. Um, and uh, so a big red chili was a little bit sweet and mild and a small green chili was hot, but there's so many variants on the market now that you, you really need to taste first. I'm just going to cry for the rest of <laughs> for the rest of no meat, mate. But most of the the volatiles are in the seed. Thank you. All right, now standby stuff. This is this, you can use corn flour, wheat flour, rice flour. I don't care. You could put anything in. Um, it's to suck up the moisture if your mix is not binding. So just have a couple of. Um, tablespoons of some sort of flour, whatever your favorite flour is. Obviously, corn flour will bind better and rice flour less, but it's not so much the binding, it's sucking up some of the liquid. And coriander, mint, and parsley. Don't waste too much time picking them, just get a really sharp knife and shave. A little bit of stem is not going to hurt. So you'll get left with most of the stem there and then just pick out the rest of the stem you don't like. Um, the stem isn't your enemy so much, but it's not <clears throat> gonna make the falafel any better, but then your time is more valuable than sitting there picking all of the herbs out, unless you've got children. They're fine to do that, because they're free. <laughs> okay, and the coriander, well, the stem is less of a problem there, because it's actually got some great flavor but shave it all down and then just give it a rough chop. Again, if you put that all in the food processor too early, you'll end up with a beautifully vibrant green falafel, but a lack of independent flavor and texture. It will become just melted together. So I wanna put the herbs in probably a little bit later after everything's ground down. So give them a head start. And that, is as good as you need it, seriously. There's one or two bits of stem, but they're not gonna really affect the final product. Okay, so let's get grinding. So I'd say the onion can go in early, it doesn't matter what, uh, the garlic, so you can go in early. Sorry about the noise. And grind. Now, I'm gonna show you where we're at in here, just so you get a visual. So it's pretty close. And the things you're looking for at this stage, obviously is to grind it up so you can eat it, but also some binding. So grab some in your hand and see, is it, is it actually holding together or is it all crumbly? And the stickiness on your hand. So this is actually gonna bind really well. I doubt whether I need any in there. So let's keep grinding it away. I think the onion can go in pretty soon. Just rearrange it all in there. And actually, Simon, just preempting a question on, um, for our friends, our gluten free friends. Um, what would you use? A, a you can use gluten free flour or. or um... Yeah, the rice flour is fine and pure corn flour is fine. Um, most corn flour is actually not corn flour, but pure corn flour is fine. Um, so rice or, or corn flour, you can throw in lentil flour, it doesn't matter, it's trying to suck up a little bit of the moisture, because um, you don't have any gluten to bind, you're just relying on the starches in there. Oh, cool. All right, let's go again and get it ground up. Food processors don't like me, they generally... Here we go. Stop it. We are experiencing technical difficulties. Stop it, yeah. 
And I'll fall back. We're, we're where we need to be. And one of the really telltale things is it climbs up the side of the food processor and sticks to the walls. And that shows you that the starches are actually getting sticky because it's climbing up the walls. Um, on some food processes, it'll ball around the middle. And that's a really good thing because it means that it's going to hold its shape. So we give it a little blast. All right, so we've the got sound, rid of the noise. The sound just dropped out a little bit there, but what was that last ingredient that went in? That was so I put in a little bit of baking powder. Ah, cool. Now, the reason I've done that is because the mix can be quite dense and we're trying to lighten it up. So when it, the, it'll activate with heat and water and when the falafel hits the oil, it'll just puff slightly and it just takes that, that sort of, sometimes you eat a falafel well, let me go back a stage. Sometimes you eat a falafel and it just tastes like a bit of cardboard. Well, that's because it was um, made by a robot and set about 20,000 miles overseas and then microwaved in, in a shop. Sometimes you eat one and it tastes okay, but the texture is like um, chipboard. And that's because the mix is just a little bit dense. So we're just puffing the mix a little bit with the, um, with the baking powder. So, people are saying slow down a bit. Yeah. I'm confusing them. I'm not used to going at a slow speed and I'm, I've been bored by it for months. So, you know, <laughs> let me go crazy. The speed you cut that onion, I think you lost the soul when you cut that onion. We're all sort of, um, yeah, <laughs> still, still peeling the skin. Uh, no, you can come back and look later, but there's your falafel <laughs> mix. Now, let's just do a little test here. This, now have some faith because a lot of this is like, it's not going to work, it's not going to work, well it won't work as soon as you say that. And you'll start folding in so many bits of corn flour that it'll get really lucky. So have a little bit of faith. You need a delicate touch here. So get yourself the best 50 cents you can spend is a falafel press. So this is a donut one, so it's got a hole in the middle. These really help you because they cook the falafel a lot quicker. They're in the Persian grocers. Spray it down with oil. Try not to use water on it. You don't want to add water into the mix. And you pull the lever back and you press it down onto the mix. Now, you can be violent at this stage. No problems. Chuck it all into the press. And then you say to yourself, well, that doesn't look like it'll hold together. Well, it kind of will if your oil's the right temperature. And then you very, very gently drop them into the oil. And I'll show you this in a minute. And it, it's very fragile, but that's what's gonna give you the beautiful, beautiful texture. And you can't do this in a massive production situation. It has to be done with a little bit of patience and care. And you're very, it's very tempting to do them all and then try and drop them in the oil. But honestly, I have more success just dropping them into the oil from the falafel press carefully. If you want to pre-do all of your little donuts and then very, very carefully pop them in the oil, you can. I've got some veggie oil back here. I've got peanut oil. It's been strained about a thousand times and reused. I don't believe in deep fryers. You get a pot, you use your oil, and then you cool it down and run it through a coffee filter. And if it's a real cold pressed, non-chemically extracted oil, you'll get a lot of uses out of an olive oil or a peanut. So let's cook, cook some falafels. I'm just going to taste the mix for salt. It's nice. So, so, I mean, if you don't have a uh, don't have a falafel press, I mean, you, you get them from a supermarket or um, 
a paper smart or something, I guess. But, but if you don't have one, you just put them together like that and make one a couple of you spoons. Can, you, you know, if you've been watching MasterChef where they do everything stupid, you could make a quenelle. Yeah. If you want, you can just make a little natural ball. And let's try them all. That, but you need to give it a little bit of a pat. Yeah. And look, you can also, you don't have to fry it all the way through, right? You can just drop it in the oil and then pop it in the oven to finish through. So I like the falafel press because it's quick and easy, but you don't have to have one. They're just a great investment for a couple of dollars. Shall we fry, Ryan? Let's do it. Let's do some fry fry. So 180 odd degree oil, which means it's just got a shimmer on it. This oil is too hot because I've been waffling on. So I'll just pull it off the stove for a minute. It's probably sitting at about 200, I'd say. I'll chuck a little bit in and it'll spit and carry on. We'll get away with it. All right, so again, falafel press. If, if you've got a little bit of oil just to get it going, that helps. You don't have to. And press it in, clean it up. And then obviously be careful, hot oil, you know, yada, yada, yada. You ready, Joshy? Good. Joshy's my camera guy. Now, if it explodes into a pile of rubbish, that's all right. We can come back and add some corn flour or rice starch into it. Luckily, it hasn't. So let's try one of our non-robotically made ones, which is just naturally formed. This one's just naturally formed. I think we're going to have a little bit of trouble. And if you're naturally forming, I would actually suggest you probably need to pop a little bit of corn flour in. And these are definitely not golden because the oil's too hot, but it'll cool as we go. So let's try this. If it just explodes too bad, we'll clean up the oil and go again. Uh, a lot of this depends on the year of harvest of your chickpea and broadbean and stuff. Sorry to get all technical, but um, if it's a this year's harvest, um, it'll generally bind better. If you've got something that's been sitting around for a hundred years in a silo, um, generally, it has trouble binding. It's lost a lot of the starches. Um, if you want to sesame them, I'll show you that. So you just, which is nice, just to have a little bit of sesame crust, just push them into sesame and knock off the extra. And just double check it on the oils again. You said you're using the peanut oil, but you can use a sunflower oil or canola or... Um... Any vegetable? Yeah. Oil? Don't be fooled by oil. If it's the price of water, it's going to be a problem. Oil is expensive stuff. To get um, a, a, a nut or especially a grain or rice and to get oil out of it, it's quite a complex process. Um, generally, they use a solvent and heat which degrades the quality of the oil. My rule of thumb, and sorry to terrify you, is if you're not paying about $15 a litre for your oil, there might be something wrong with it. Um, good olive oil, um, as in cold pressed extra virgin, um, can be reused so many times for deep frying. And it's good, good for you, the omega-3, 6 and 9 balances. Um, you'll quite often see written on an oil that it's cold pressed, but that doesn't mean it's not solvent extracted and have a google um there are plenty of good oils and don't be tricked into these sort of really simplistic arguments of what is a good oil and what is a bad oil what is a good oil you can actually make quite a good oil out of and everyone's going to complain about this canola um if you press it and don't use a whole heap of chemicals if you cold press it um it's still every oil has a problem but have a look at oils and some of the information around them. It's a whole minefield, but it shouldn't be the price of water, seriously. It's ridiculous. So have we got a pretty good idea here about what a falafel comes out like? Yeah, they look great. 
Um, they're nice, they're really tasty, and they're a vibrant green inside from the herbs, but see how the herbs haven't just gone through the whole mix. As, uh, so it doesn't look like a lurid green mix, it's sort of bits and pieces. So do you want the rest of your dinner, Ryan? What's going with it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's, it's, um, you've got the tabbouleh and hummus coming up, yeah? Yep. And, you, and just to check check with you again, you get them out of the fryer, you, you're draining them on the paper, and then you just press them into some uh, sesame seeds to get that. Uh, oh, no, I'll do that again for you, Ryan. Yeah. Thanks for keeping me honest. That's all right. I was... Um, got so, of... falafel yeah. in the press, little yeah. bowl of sesame, press it in. Beautiful. And the action that you need to get this off, the correct action, is actually to flick it off. So stand back and just flick and then it'll drop. I've been trying to do it really gently, but now the oil temperature's right. It naturally lets itself go if you give it a flick. And it's not dangerous, just stay low and you just flick. Whoops, yep. that one didn't come off. All right, so we'll make the rest of the stuff. Is that, do you reckon we've still got an attention span? It will take about five minutes. I'm good. I think, we, I think we're good. We're going up. We've got more people watching. It's uh, so yeah. More people losing. watching. We're not losing people. We're going up. So it's all good. <laughs> wow. All right. I'm just going to rinse this out quickly. It's got a little few drags of the uh, falafel mix in there. So if you had to soak some chickpeas, you may as well soak double and have a hummus. Um, so I've got another lot of junk here. And the, the hummus is very, very quick. Again, I, I don't know why people buy hummus when it's so easy to make and it's absolutely sensational if you've got a good lemon, a good chickpea and some good oil. So I've got another half a cup of chickpeas that I've soaked. And that honestly, there is nothing like a, a, a properly grown chickpea. The flavor is amazing um, compared to a tin, which has too much salt in my opinion, too much sugar, and it's been cooked too long. A lentil takes about 20 minutes to cook a chickpea, about 35, 40. Um, if it takes longer, it's an old harvest, old silo sitting around forever. All right, so I then drain the water off and cook them for about 25 to 35 minutes till they're just to the two. And then there's a little puddle of water left in there. I, the more water you use to cook chickpeas, the longer they will take. That's a bit of um, food science craziness. There's an enzyme in there and you dilute it. So, four to five parts water to one part chickpea and they'll cook very quickly. So chuck them in the food processor, get yourself a third odd of a cup of uh, uh, tahini, preferably unholed, which means that the skin is on the sesame. So the dark stuff. And then a clove of garlic. Go easy with the garlic, it goes through the hummus like crazy, unless you're an absolute garlic fiend. I'm just multitasking and picking up a few extra falafels. And Simon, I've got a All question right. here. Got a question here from Cheryl, and she's asking uh, when you get homemade hummus, you're not putting preservatives in there. How long does it keep in the fridge? Okay, so um, it keeps for about two weeks. Always clean container, cl clean hands when you're working. Don't double dip in there. Um, the pH of the lemon, the acid of the lemon pushes it away from being pH neutral. A chickpea is very high protein. Food spoilage is generally moisture, um, cross-contamination, protein levels, and pH being neutral. The lemon is your and the salt are your two oldest preserving methods, acid and salt. You will easily get two weeks out of your hummus. In a commercial one, they put citric acid. Um, and the, I don't like the flavor. I like lemon, why not use it? Yeah. So I don't know, it's up to you how much lemon you want. The recipe's on the website. I, I like a really zingy. A really good cold pressed olive oil. Kangaroo Islands have um, actually a hellish time. They survive on 
Um, a lot of uh, food production, they had bushfires, half the island, and they survive on tourism. Well, that's gone. So I'm using a kangaroo island olive oil. I usually use in Adelaide Hills, but they need the help and it's a beautiful cold pressed oil. Their broad bean crops um, would have been okay, luckily for the fires. Um, so that's fantastic, but they've had it really hard. So get your food processors ready. Hummus does take quite a bit of salt and it is a preservative. Um, so that's it, that's hummus. That's all that goes in there. Um, another, another, another question um, from Angela is asking how much how much tahini again? So just to get those um, proportions of uh, tahini to chickpeas. Oh, it sounds your sounds dropped out on us there. My question was. There you go, we're back in again. How much tahini would you say? Um, we missed how much the, the measurement was. Third of a cup. Third of a cup, okay. And I'm sorry, Ryan, cut me off. I've got to blend again, just turn me down. You're good. Back. Right, this is quite chunky because I don't want to drive you crazy forever. It doesn't quite have enough oil because it's not shiny enough, in my opinion. The shine is a really good way of judging it, uh, the oil content. Um, and by that, I mean, if it's very dull, it definitely doesn't have enough oil. It'll taste a bit kind of uh, like a bit of chalk. Um, if it's too oily, it gets pretty heavy. So this is pretty close, but I do need to blend it longer. Flavor's perfect. It's just still got a, a few chunks in it. Ryan, talk to people for one minute while I finish. Is that okay? Yeah, 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 all good. So if you've got questions, um, we're moving through pretty fast with this recipe, but the good news is you can um, go back. Um, it'll be saved on the Facebook page, so you'll be able to uh, revisit and uh, look at the ingredients and you know come back and cook along with Simon at your own time. But if you've got any questions on the first 15, 20 minutes, just drop them in the feed here and we'll um, we'll answer them as we go. He's back. I'm back, Ryan. So the hummus just needed a bit of a blend. It is a bit of a, a blendy blend. There's a few questions there, um, Brian. Can I answer them? Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Are they Australian grown chickpeas? Shit, yeah. Um, I, for the last eight years, have had a business. So shameless plug. Um, York Peninsula chickpeas, last year's harvest is always this year's product. We bring them off the ground at the end of summer. Um, York Peninsula lentils are going to be used in, in the Tabuli and Kangaroo Island um, broad beans. Um, have a look at that. Like, buy any good Australian products. They're all good, especially South Australian. We actually have an amazing climate to grow chickpeas. Um, there was a question about Joshi, something else. Uh, someone mentioned the uh, first falafel that they cooked for, uh, and uh, she's very happy with it. So thank you, Chef. That's good. Well, you you just this is how you do it anyway. This is how I eat my falafels. And the process of emulsification when you're adding the oil. Yeah, um, it'll go bluey if there's too much oil in too early. Um, it doesn't matter. You come back to it a couple of hours later, it'll be okay. Um, 
you just see this slight bit of shine. That's what I'm after. The best thing you can do is keep a little bit of your, and I didn't explain it properly, a little bit of the water that was in the pot cooking the chickweed, chickpeas aquafaba. Um, it will actually fluff it up nicely and bring it all together. It'll bond it together. So it, it all emulsifies into it and it'll never split. So just put a bit down, get a few falafels. And the questions come through from Ben. Where, where can you buy your products, your chickpeas? Uh, you, we have distributors in Sydney and we have distributors in Adelaide. But if you hit the website dirty, it'll kind of tell you. Thank you for supporting me on poor people at the moment. So I like a little bit of parsley, a little bit of smoked paprika. Absolutely. Like just gives that, um, I don't know, something about smoky stuff in winter that I kind of like. Sweet smoked paprika preferably is my favorite, but it's up to you. And then a little bit of oil over them. And that's your falafel. So if you want to turn this into a complete meal, we'll give you another thing, which is very quick. Um, Ryan, do you have another couple of minutes for me? Yeah, go for it, go for it. So listen, do we want to say, um, it looks like we do have a few people that are clicking along and keeping up. Do we want to say the first person to post a pick in the thread um, wins the prize? We, we, you know, oh, look, I think that's a fair call. We've got a box of products. And I think, Ryan, we, which book are we giving away? The, the, it's that one? No, no, the oh, first that one. one. Okay. So, Ryan, you, I think that's a fair call. All right, so everyone's madly running to the kitchen now to, to, uh, to win. So I'll just show you one of my other favorite things is when you pick wheat before, um, probably um, before summer gets roaching, end of winter start of, um, it's in the springtime, you get a green wheat. It hasn't dried off properly yet. Um, we have a lot of wheat um, in our north, west, um, and there's a company called Green Wheat Freakers. So they pick the wheat and traditionally you pick that and you burn it on the road. And, and Freaker is burnt green wheat. It's an amazing product. Well, they, they don't burn it on the road because cars are meant to go on the road, but they use the same process. So chuck your Freaker in a pot. Green Wheat Freaker is my preferred one, but you'll be able to get Freaker anywhere. Cracked just cooks quicker than whole. And I'm making a tabbouleh, but I've always had a problem with tabbouleh not really being what I want to eat. Because it just, uh, like I'd like burgle, but I like freaker better. So the wheat part of my tabbouleh is going to be freaker. And then all you need is a ton of cucumber. And I like it chunkier. I find it too small when, I, when someone makes it for me. So I've, I've cut my tomatoes really coarse. I cut my cucumber really coarse and because it's not summer the way you pimp your tomatoes is in a summer tomato will have an incredible acid sugar balance so use a bit of vinegar I've got an Adelaide Hills aged vinegar red vinegar which is like amazing but any vinegar will be okay and the evil poison of the whole western world sugar because the tomato hasn't developed the right sugar and acid balance, you need it to make it taste like a real summer tomato. It's a bit of a chef cheat, we all do it, we just never confess to it and tell the general public. So chuck that in and that will taste like a beautiful summer tomato now. And then it's basically dirt, a shed load of parsley, um, a shed load of coriander and mint and some spring onion, again, cut bigger than normal because I like the texture. And then you've just got to oil it up and get it to powder. So olive oil. And again, lemons, right now you can't use enough lemons. The trees are bursting with lemons. Like I've got to fight the rats off the lemons every night. Um, not a great endorsement for my lemons, I know, but they're everywhere, lemons, and limes are just about sort of, you know, at the beautiful yellow ripeness. And then some salt, 
And it looks like a lot, but there's a lot of cardboardy flavors in here. And this is the perfect sort of accompaniment to the falafel. And it's so, it's easy. But my final bit of pimping is I add lentils in, mainly because I grow them, so it costs me nothing. So another half a cup of lentils into two and a half cups of water, 20 minutes. No need to soak lentils, they don't require a soak. And then you've got two layers of texture in your tamale. And you've got a whopping amount of protein. So this meal is really solid GI, really high protein. You've got levels of chickpeas and broad beans laid up twice and then lentils. And, and the protein in the green wheat is actually very high. If you've got a little bit of problem with wheat digestibility, green wheat burnt is highly digestible. Um, a bit like the sourdough process. It's a different sort of strain of gluten that you end up with. So that's it. If there's any questions, is there any winners out there, Ryan? We do. We, look, we had Paula Cash and, uh, and Kim who were in the running um, for the prize there. They look like they're both cooking along with you, but Kim couldn't leave the screen. She couldn't um, uh, leave the screen to post a pic because she didn't want to lose um, any, anything you were saying. So Paul has come through the goods. Paul has uh, posted a falafel, which looks great. And um, so she'll be getting this excellent cookbook. We'll post out to you on, um, on Monday. Um, Ryan, can I give Kim at least the three packets of lentils? Because I understand what it's like not being able to leave the kitchen. Yeah, Kim gets the prize as well. Deal. Yeah, so if we can get your um, address through Ryan or whatever, Kim, we'll, we'll send you out the, the South Australian lentils and chickpeas. Nice one, nice one. Unless we have a Kiora from uh, Kira Kirioa, Kira someone from New Zealand here. And we've got a question from uh, someone around Tahini. You get Tahini made in Australia. Do you know anyone that makes it here? Yeah, so if you go to a really good health food shop, we're blessed in South Australia, but a lot of places are. One of my other favourite places is Orange. For you New Zealanders, you live, you truly live in a beautiful country. And um, we love your Prime Minister. Can we have her? Can you share her with us or, or something? Um, but um, they have the presses and they will run the sesame through. That's all sesame, tahini is, it's just crushed sesame. So a good health food shop with one of the presses and you, they might be doing peanut butter, that's the dead giveaway, that they're already into pressing stuff. So yes, you can. If not, there's a very good, I don't know where it is and I won't bore you, but there is a very good Australian brand of unholds tahini. Um, but seek out a good whole food or a health food shop. Yep, nice one. And listen, there's all there's a heap of comments here, Simon, saying welcome back, good to see you back cooking, and uh, everyone seems to have enjoyed the session. So, um, but uh, yeah, so no more questions I can see here, except yeah, a lot of love for you, Simon. So um, thank you for again for your time today and and for showing us a few of your tricks. Yeah, we'll just leave you on on um, like you've. Um, if you could cook this for your mum tomorrow, that would make me the most happiest person in the world. You have one mum. Um, she's probably a pain in the ass, but um, <laughs> love her to death, value her, um, and happy Mother's Day for all of you people in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, if you're in America, good luck. You need it. Um, and hey, Dad and Uncle Brian in the UK. <laughs> Nice one. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Really appreciate it, mate. And um, hope, hopefully we get to do this again. Um, and yeah, for everyone else out there, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Nomeg May for people who've signed up. And if you haven't signed up already, go on to um, nomegmay.net and you can sign up and join us for the rest of the month. We've got a really awesome Facebook group at the moment. There's about four and a half thousand people around the world, all the corners of the world, all sharing recipes and supporting each other through the month. Um, Everyone's welcome, no matter which you know where you're at with your your journey. But it's all supporting everyone to head in that less meat direction um, for all those big reasons. So yeah, thanks again, Simon, um, and thanks everyone for joining us. And Ryan, thank you for leading uh, the good fight, and um, have a really good no meat mate. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everyone. That was a bit rough, but I think we